and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to another uh, webinar, uh, part of the Elgar, uh, Edward Elgar series on central banking monetary policy. This week's webinar is on monetary policy and the environment. We have two guest speakers. And um, I, before I turn over official duties to Silvio Capes, I want to welcome everybody and I want to thank those who have agreed to participate this week. And uh, we only have two speakers, so I think we'll have lots of time to discuss. Three, three. Luison, show it up. I, I just forgot to tell you. Perfect. By... We do have three speakers. And um, welcome, thank you, and it's up to you now, uh, Silvio. Okay, thank you, Louis Philippe. I will briefly introduce our three speakers today and then pass over to Romain, who will start the presentations. Let me just find the, their bios. So, Romain Zwartzman, the first present to present, works as an economist on sustainable finance and climate related risks at the Banque de France. He previously worked for the International Finance Corporation at the World Bank Group as our an environmental and social consultant, and as an investor in clean technologies for a French venture capital firm. Romain completed his PhD in ecological macroeconomics at McGill University, Canada. I will introduce the, the, the other presenters when I, I pass over to them. So Romain, you have 20, 25 minutes to your presentation. If you are going to use the slides, please tell me if you have any issue so we can yeah. try to fix it. And after your presentation, I will open to two questions. Now, I just want to, to say one thing before Romain starts for the questions. I will say it again, just to reinforce. Something that we did in the previous webinar and worked quite well, in my opinion, is the raise hand option of the Zoom. So for those who don't know how to, to raise their hands, in the menu below, you see the participants button. You can click there and there will, it's, it must appear a uh, raise hand option in the below right corner. So tell me if you can find it. And that's what we use it in the previous webinar. People raise their hands and a list shows up to me and to Hoshon as hosts of the event so we can see who raised their hand first and second and third, and this way we can arrange nicely the, the question. So Romain, it's up to you now. Nice to see you. Thank you very much, Silvio. Um, and thanks a lot to, um, uh, to yourself and, and Guillaume um, and Louis Philippe for, for inviting me today. Um, so I will be presenting um, an overview, basically, of, of uh, how central banks are approaching uh, the question of climate change. Um, so it will be mostly a, an institutional perspective of how they're doing it. And I will try to bring two kind of uh, critical perspectives while I do so, at least to, to the extent possible. The first one is based on a book I co-author called the, the Green Swan. Um, and the second one tried to reflect at least, at least a little bit, given the, the audience today, on how uh, post keynesian insight could be useful to discussion and, and also perhaps a bit more, uh, uh, not provocative, not in a provocative manner, but also try to show perhaps the limitation as well of post keynesian uh, of post keynesian theory to think about these issues. So try to to to, to address these two um, these two issues. So um, so I'll, I'll do that in four parts. I will really uh, at the beginning provide an overview of why the two mandates basically of central banks, so the the, the, the two common mandates I would say of price stability. Um, and the perhaps somehow less official but still important mandate of, of financial stability are threatened by climate-related risk. Then I will try to argue that what we're facing is really uh, much more about radical uncertainty, but I will bring that mostly from an environmental perspective. So it's, uh, it's environmental uncertainty, we could say, and that's how I will tie this to the concept of Green Swan. Um, and then I will, I will try to discuss a little bit how this creates new dilemma for central banks uh, where post keynesian theory can help and also, that, that would be my fourth part if I have some time, some new challenges, which I think go beyond the traditional divide we somehow sometimes have between uh, orthodox, heterodox, and your classical post keynesian that are really new challenges that we, sh we should be uh, thinking about when, when it comes to these issues. So I, I don't want to, to, to waste too much time on, on some sort of uh, introduce uh, climate change 101, but 
I just wanted to, to emphasize, in case you're not familiar with these issues, that uh, obviously climate change, uh, global warming is, has already started. Climate change is a serious issue. When you look at the, 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 the scientific literature, you see that um, many scientists are actually extremely concerned. So that's, for instance, a, a quote from uh, more than 11,000 scientists who say, and I quote, that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. And what we see, if you look at the reports from the, the IPCC, the International, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, you have all these impacts of climate change, such as an increasing extreme temperature, sea level rise, impacts on ecosystem, and so on, that can have multiple type of impact on human system and therefore on, on socioeconomic system. So th there are a lot of concern, as you can see on the, on the map on the right, for instance, about many places in the world that could become basically too hot to be really, um, to be um, in, in, in habitable, habitable, sorry, by the end of the century. And you could have a bunch of other issues such as food, water security, uh, there are studies on the potential conflicts, migration that could uh, that could happen, and some scientists here. I'm not talking about you, about you know like some uh, people who who want to be like catastrophic uh, per se, but really some scientists who talk about the threat of extinction for part of humanity. So you you have these issues that are coming to the fore today. Um, so that brings the question basically, and here I will jump into my presentation of why why should central banks care about that basically? And and the, the, over the past five years. Um, Central bankers and some financial supervisors have started to argue that um, their two mandates of price and financial stability are being threatened by, uh, by climate change. And they have created um, a network called the NGFS, which stands for Network for Greening the Financial System, which today is composed of 66 uh, members, basically central banks and financial supervisors and also 13 observers, uh, such as the Bank for International Settlements, the IMF, uh, World Bank, and so on. And in their first report, the NGFS in its first report say that uh, climate-related risks are a source of financial risk, and I'm quoting here, it is therefore within the mandate of central banks and supervisors to ensure the financial system is resilient to these risks. So they, they really take um, the, 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 the perspective that it, it is within uh, their mandate, which is a very strong statement. Um, usually, we distinguish two kinds of, uh, of climate-related risk. Uh, the first one are physical risk, and that relates to the previous slide, basically all the potential impacts of climate change. So you could have devastating impacts on real estate. For instance, uh, most of the literature shows that developing economies may be much more at risk, both because part of them are more exposed, and obviously because many of them are also more uh, vulnerable. They have less capacity to respond um, to, to, to some shock. And then you have the second type of shock, which uh, of, of risk, sorry, which are transition risk. And transition risk basically rely to, uh, relates to the idea that if we wanted to avoid the physical risk I just mentioned, we need an immediate uh, and very rapid, very strong uh, transition toward the low carbon economy. And that raises a bunch of risks related to policy, carbon prices, technology, social norms, and so on. And most of the literature here has focused on, on, the, on the topic of stranded assets. Uh, stranded assets re related to the, points to the fact that if we wanted to uh, remain be below 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, which are the, somehow the safe boundaries or relatively safe boundaries, and we have already hit it by one degree, more than one degree or about one degree uh, compared with uh, pre-industrial time, so we have very little margin. But if we wanted to do that, the vast majority of um, of fossil fuel reserves, of existing reserves, should remain in the ground, and that could lead to a very sudden or abrupt reassessment of their value and possibly, and that, that's in the words of Mark Carney when he was uh, governor of the, the Bank of England, he called this uh, the possibility of some sort of climate Minsky moment. So there is uh, this whole concern and you can see here on the graph that um, then you, you could have interaction between physical risk and transition risk. It's not like you have one or the other. You could be in a world where you want to have a transition but you have wildfire. This is what we're already having. You could have second round effect, etc. So that's somehow the overview of why and how financial stability is, uh, is threatened. When it comes to price stability, there is much less in the literature, uh, but the NGFS just published a report a few, um, a few weeks ago. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the first uh, document of the NGFS on that. 
And here, uh, m most of the, of the risk with regard to price stability have to do, uh, for instance, with uh, supply uh, or mostly supply shock, but you could have some demand shock. You could have because of physical risk, for instance, a, a price spike in agricultural or energy prices. And these bring new challenges for monetary policy. Uh, for instance, the, the governor of Banque de France, uh, Villeroy de Gallo, argues that um, some of the shock could really be long-term and create some stagflationary uh, patterns. Uh, you have the issue that the, the vast majority of monetary policy is thought at the national level, whereas global, uh, climate change requires global solutions. Uh, Benoit Curé also talked about the idea of how should we think about preemptive measures and not only be responding in terms of monetary, monetary policy, but really try to see how uh, ex ante we should perhaps change the way we do monetary policy because of, of climate change. And that's actually one of the questions that is now part of the strategic review of the, uh, the, the, the ECB, the European uh, Central Bank. So basically what, what we see is that whether it is because of um, financial stability or price stability, we have some, somehow like the same speech, the same discourse, which is we need to better measure the risk and then we can act on them. So it's really a risk-based approach to climate change. And you can see that, uh, for instance, the first recommendation of the NGFS to all its members, uh, it's about, and I quote, integrating climate-related risk into financial stability, monitoring, and micro-supervision. So in other words, it, we have to, to include climate-related risk into macro-prudential and micro-prudential um, policy. And when it comes to, to price stability, again, this, this is more recent, but uh, there's this idea that um, central banks should or they would benefit from enhanced assessment of the potential impact of, of climate change. And here they talk about uh, natural rate of interest. So we, that, I think it's, we can put this debate aside. I know that's, that that will be controversial for many, but I think it's still the, the, the philosophy is the same, which is that we really need to understand how it will impact us so that we can act on it. And they also acknowledge central banks that this is easier uh, said than, than done and that we need new ways of working on that because uh, when you talk about physical risk, the, the, you know, like we, we already have an increase in natural catastrophe, but that's nothing compared to what could happen. And when we talk about transition risk, basically they have not happened because we're not transitioning to a low carbon economy. So you cannot rely on existing data and you need um, what, what Pereira Silva, the, the, the deputy general manager of the BIS called an epistemological break with regard to risk management, or basically we need new methodologies to, to measure this risk. And for instance, uh, Banque de France and others, uh, other central banks we were already working on what came to be known as climate stress tests, for instance. And with price stability, there are some work, um, but uh, Yanis will talk more about that, but there's, there are some work carried out about how we could integrate the question of climate change into, uh, into monetary policy. And, and this is where, uh, in, in the book, the Greens one, what we argue is that um, it, it is interesting to do that and it is definitely necessary, you really need to do it, um, but we should be careful in the sense that there is so much uncertainty with regard to both physical and transition risk that basically uh, we will never be able to capture the whole range basically of geopolitical, trade, economic, social uh, issues that should happen so that we could have a low carbon transition and that even if we had that we would still need to understand for the purpose of a risk management strategy how each firm uh, would react within each sector and um, there's way too much uncertainty even if you, you, you work on scenarios where basically you don't attribute a probability uh, to the occurrence of each scenario even when you do that you realize that there are so many things so many variables and parameters going on that it is difficult to um, to really uh, deal with that. So we need to embrace basically the concept of radical uncertainty and think in terms of structural change or system-wide uh, transition. And this is just one example uh, in the case of physical risk where you realize that if you want to measure them actually, you need to uh, make some bets on you know, like which ecosystem will be threatened by climate change, how, how it could cascade down to other ecosystems. This is a map of how all these some of these ecosystems are connected and the problem is that we have tipping points. So when you pass, you, you cross a certain uh, threshold, your ecosystem uh, completely shift toward uh, new behavior, uh, new patterns. Uh, you have nonlinearity, cascading effects, and so on. And, and, and actually, there's a large literature today that says that existing climate economic models, climate economy models, the, the YAMs or integrated assessment models, basically completely fail to account for this tail risk or 
for this uh, for the fact that we could be in serious trouble and if you do risk management that's what you want to measure you want to measure somehow the tail risk and not you know like what happened if everything goes more or less uh you know like if you have like a small impact on gdp by the end of the century so for example nick stern who's a leading climate economist argues now that you know like these models can be grossly misleading uh, in terms of uh, what their outcome and the kind of policy recommendations they they lead to when it comes to transition risk that's also just an example many things need to change but one very important issue obviously is which technologies would prevail in a low carbon uh, economy and here, if you take the six models that inform the, the IPCC, the, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, you see that even among themselves, they have completely different pictures of what kind of uh, energy mix would prevail in a two degrees war by the end of the century. So if you look at the, the three models on the right, they really bet strongly on renewable. Uh, if you look at the image model, it really bets on energy efficiency. Uh, then you can see that the red part at the bottom, you have some models that argue that we could have coal in the energy mix by the end of the century, which at first time, at first sight, is really goes really against the idea that you know coal is the most polluting uh, sector. But you realize that there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's just one question: the energy mix. There's much more uh, than that. So that's how we, we got to the concept to, to, to feeling that we needed somehow to, to capture this with uh, a concept, which we we use the concept of, of green swan, which is obviously. Uh, reference to, to Nassim Taleb's uh, black swan when he refers to uh, an expected event that can be extreme and that are usually ex uh, explained ex post with, uh, I think, what he calls um, a retrospective rationalization, I think. And we argue that green swans have these features, but they have two uh, even more concerning somehow features. The first one is that despite all the uncertainty, we have basically no idea of when, where, and how uh, the risk will materialize. But there's also a lot of certainty. Scientific evidence is telling us that these risks are building up. So we can't say that we didn't know it could occur. We just don't know how, when, and, and, uh, and where. And the second one is that many of these risks, and again, that's what is emphasized by, 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 by climate science, are irreversible. And some of them really bring existential risks. So it's not some sort of a Mad Max kind of war, but existential risk, at least for hundreds of millions of people who uh, may lose their uh, their home due to climate change. So that's still uh, existential in, in this sense. And, and that leads us to say that um, risk management is failed to, uh, I mean, is do doomed to fail somehow because um, these are unhedgeable risks that the only way, at least from an individual risk management perspective, the only way to avoid them or to handle them is really through, through this idea of structural change or a system-wide transition. And I use both uh, interchangeably here. So, that, that creates um, a, a big dilemma, I would say, for, for central banks, um, because it, it places them between two uh, uncomfortable positions, basically. The first one is to, to say that, um, that, you know, like that if these risks are that big, as I presented, then it's not their job to, to, ma to manage them. It's, you know, like the, the government's job, the private sector, whoever it is, it is not their job. But in practice, uh, saying that would amount to accept that the risk keeps building up, which also goes against the mandate. So it creates this sort of, of tension. And on the other hand, what we see is that there's a lot of pressure today, a lot of debates about how far the central banks should go in terms, some, in terms of somehow solving climate change. And, 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 and that's obviously uh, influenced by the, by the role that central banks have played for, for the past decades, and, and especially over the past decade since uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, but that really, and I mean, to, to any post keynesian scholar, it will be obvious, but unfortunately, it really, I think, um, shapes the debate. There's this idea that uh, central banks could um, somehow solve uh, the question of climate change. And, and obviously, I mean, it, it needs to be reminded in a lot of cases, but central banks cannot lead a structural change. They cannot decide over which industrial policy, which energy mix, uh, how we, we handle the distribution impact of climate adaptation and mitigation and so on. So I would say that what we see is that the, the limits to monetary policy and to, to prudential policy, actually, and especially the need for fiscal policy, which are obvious to, to any post keynesian the, the, what is interesting is that they become even more evident with the question of, of climate change. So in, in the Greens one, the way we handle that, because we're still addressing a, a community of central bankers, is really to say that um, this pushes us uh, outside our comfort zone and basically that if we want to continue fulfilling our own mandates of financial and price stability we need to push for the coordination that should happen so we're, we're kind of like 
rejecting the idea that this is not our job and rejecting the idea that uh, we should just do more and more and more to solve uh, to solve these issues. So we we try somehow to to push for this um, the third way. And the, the way we do it obviously is by proposing some uh, interaction between uh, monetary and fiscal policy. That's the, the most obvious one, especially in the, in the context of low interest rates in, in high income economies, um, with a strong role for development banks. Um, we also talk about um, the need to, to, to regulate the financial system to promote uh, long-term sustainable investment. Uh, we talk about possible international reform of the international monetary system. Uh, there are quite some very interesting debates today about the, the possibility of issuing green special drawing rights. I mean, that's just an example, but I mean, these are all the issues where we show that central banks have a role to play, but that it would only work if you have other agents, other players uh, playing their part as well. And that's really what we, we try to, um, to emphasize there. And I think that everything, I mean, all I say may, may be pretty obvious to, to post-Keynesian uh, scholars, uh, but where things get uh, a bit more difficult, I would say, is that um, I would say that climate change, and here I rely on Will Stephan, uh, the uh, scientist, who says that climate change is only the tip of the iceberg. Basically, what, what most of the, I mean, some of the scientific community is emphasizing today is that we may have moved to uh, what, what some consider to be a new geological era, epoch, that they, they call the Anthropocene, so it literally it's the, the age of humans. And th this refers to the fact that human activity has impinged so much on so many ecosystems. So that there's the climate system, but there's the biodiversity, water stress, ozone layer, and I mean, you name it, that basically you could compare human activity to some sort of geological force, for instance. And, and, and it is interesting in the case of COVID-19 that many, um, many scientists who are, are usually so cautious about, uh, about how they, 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 you know, like they, they reach a conclusion have said that's the case of Serge Mohan, who's the, the, the president of the Agronomic um, uh, Research Center in France, who say this is an ecological crisis. This has to do with the way we are really destroying our natural habitat, so the way we're destroying biodiversity. And, and, and here, just uh, I was also interested to see that Adam Tooze, who, who's not at all a natural scientist, but recently called COVID-19 the first economic crisis of the of the Anthropocene. So the, the bottom line here is really that um, if we want to think about this issue, we're really talking about big changes, not just you know some sort of like um, policy mix with some fiscal policy, some monetary policy, and we know how to do it. It's something much bigger, um, and perhaps also some sort of um, uh, and that's where I want to, to provoke a little bit. For, I would say that even for people who are not interested in environmental issues, the question is that this is not some, somehow like an optional issue. It's something that is uh, building up, that creates more and more risk, and that needs to be reconnected, the question of environmental equality uh, to economic equality, inequalities. So we, we see, for instance, that the wealthiest 10% today emits 50% of the CO2, but we know that the vast majority of the impacts will be felt uh, for the poorest. So we really need to to be connecting these issues and not to treat the environment as some sort of nice thing to have uh, once you got rich, basically, which is still the, the vision that uh, many people have. So one, once we bring this question, I would say that um, these issues, I would say that th this raises new questions, uh, which uh, here I say that escape existing analytical framework in the sense that they escape perhaps the way we, we conceive the debates between orthodox, heterodox, or between neoclassical, post keynesian and so on. These really bring new questions. Um, if I have time, I'll just mention briefly two of them here. The first one is, for instance, the question of how should we be thinking about the higher resilience of socioeconomic system if we knew that we we're going to have more green swan, basically. And, and here, if we talk about the future of central banking, uh, we, we should be thinking what would be the impact on monetary policy and prudent social policy of thinking about new geographies of globalization with you know, like less uh, just-in-time production, more stocks, and perhaps less efficiency, uh, how we should be thinking about new safety nets, so obviously more public investment in health, but you know, you, you also have all the debates right now between uh, UBI, job guarantee, and I don't want to get into this debate, but really as a way of saying this would have huge impact. Um, uh, a more direct one would be the, the idea that um, we need to be even more ready to, to, to implement uh, swap lines between central banks and so on. Um, the second one, I think it's, it's already, it's a very promising area, is the fact that uh, there is some, some of this discussion have somehow already uh, reached um, a, a very interesting debate between post-Canadian economists and ecological economists with, with the, the, the creation somehow of the field 
of ecological macroeconomics, which I think is a very promising one, uh, despite strong limitations that have, I mean, uh, uh, that, 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 that have been raised, especially somehow like the face sometimes that green investment would solve everything, uh, or there's this idea of how core periphery relations should be revisited under the concept of biophysical constraint, or perhaps more related to the, the French School of Regulation, a little bit less to post Keynesian, but also how should we be thinking about a capitalist, capitalist mode of regulation with environmental constraints? So these are new questions that the field of ecological and macro has not uh, yet addressed, but I think that will be, uh, that will be very important ones. And so the b bottom line here is just to say that if we want to really, the, the title of the book of the presentation is really the future of central banking. And I would say that if we want to think about the, the, the role of central banks in the age of climate change, in the age of this broad ecological risk, uh, of course, central banks have a fundamental role to play and we shouldn't escape from it so, uh, on behalf of independence or on behalf of other issues, but these roles should not be addressed in isolation or somehow in a world of all our things being equal. So we really need to be uh, bringing full on these, uh, these massive, I think, uh, issues. And I guess I will, I will stop here uh, for now and I'm happy to, to take your questions. Thank you, Romain, for your brilliant presentation. Now we are open to, to questions from everyone here. As I said in the beginning of Romain's pre presentation, the, the preferred system for, for question is if you can raise your hands in the, in the option that Zoom has to, to us, you click in participants button below here and at the right corner you will find the raise hand option. You can also unmute yourselves and make the questions or write the question at the chat. I will take three or four questions. I ask you to be brief very brief in your questions because we have two more presentations today so i'm open mario raised his hand so let us go for for mario question uh, yes uh, thank you uh, romain c'était très bien uh, i uh, would like to uh, uh, ask um, Basically, two two questions, if I remember both now. <laughs> but uh, I'll start with the first one, which is that, uh, as Louis Philippe knows, we've been trying for years now, trying to deal with the central bank to give up its mandate of just worrying about inflation targeting. And uh, and yet you have all these uh, banks that are concerned about prudential risk, including climate risk. Mm -hmm. They're all talking about it. You know, our former, you know, <laughs> governor there uh, also there has been uh, talking about it big times, you know, Mark Carney, and and how and this is the the thing that I would like to ask and uh, as how do they reconcile these two in the context of all these countries and they're like over thirty or something of them who still go around saying that all they're doing, including our current new governor of the Bank of Canada, that says he has not changed. You know, he still believes in the principle of inflation targeting as being the only thing that they could do, you know, really, you know, uh, of substance, which is sort of ironic, you know, and as I said, uh, so uh, that is something which I, I would like, perhaps if you could uh, at least, uh, you know, say something about it. Uh, mm -hmm. You are at the Banque de France, and you have a project going on like that. So, how did they, you know, how did they reconcile all these things? It is for sure a big question. And the other one, of course, uh, and very briefly here, which has to do with the fact that you have uh, central banks. I think could play a role not only in terms of the kind of prudential risk issues that you've uh, elaborated upon, but uh, something which I. Well, I think you alluded, you did mention it, but maybe you could say something a little more, which has to do with the, the way in which they can back these kind of green new deals, so to speak, you know, meaning that uh, it, uh, there's a kind of financing side. Now, there are people arguing, well, we should get central banks. I, I, I'm not sure what, you know, I mean, I have opinion about that. I have a lot of problems with some of that. But I would like you to at least perhaps address this issue if you can in some way, because mm -hmm. I think it is a big issue in reality uh, and we sh one should get a handle over it. Romain, can you 
collect questions first and then answer all of sure. them. Yeah, it's fine. So we have a second question from David. Thank you for your presentation, Romain. Um, I, I think, and I come through this through uh, the teaching of uh, environmental economics as well, and in particular the growth of interest in ecological economics. And I think there is a complete collision going on with uh, environmental economics as a whole, but specifically ecological economics and um, neoliberalism. And, and I need to ask you what you're expecting because the crisis is enormous. Um, th there is a, a, a serious critique of growth per se and its measurement. Um, banks, to my knowledge, particularly in North America, have not dealt with structural issues. For example, relative pricing of resources and other aspects of the economy, except obliquely in some research. Where is this going? I, my, my view currently is the central banks are on the side of in extinction, okay? They, they will do well and be happy and live a high lifestyle at the top level as we head towards extinction. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not exaggerating on that score. I mean, it's happening regularly. And, and uh, you know, I would like your prediction of what's happening. Will they just be uh, blasé about the crisis and try to appear interested? Or will there be something actually done? Thank you. Thank you, David, for your question. We have a third question from Malcolm Sawyer. You're this muted, Malcolm. Myself. Okay. Yeah, I've unmuted myself, thanks. Uh, yeah. well, th thank you very much. Uh, I, I, mean, I had two, two perhaps rather general questions. I wonder if we could explore a bit more what you see as the relationship between, as I say, a cent central bank and what might be called a state investment bank. But I think some of the discussion has been quite often in the direction that almost the central bank should be playing to some extent a role through some sort of green quantitative easing or so forth on mm. actually the direct financing of green investment, for want of a better word. Mm. And I want to, my own view is that uh, that's not the role of the central bank, but I wonder if you could explore a bit more the what you would see as a relationship between the central bank and the, the state investment bank and in, so then in terms of the, the financing and funding of the, the state investment bank. Uh, the second is, uh, I wonder how, how do you think central banks and, uh, and others will in the end respond to this, these stranded assets? Mm. Um, I think my, my sort of fear, I suppose, is that they will see stranded assets as when, they, when they, the, their valuation is, 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 when the market changes their valuation of them or whatever, this uh, then threatens the uh, financial institutions that, that own these assets and um, with the change in their assets and liabilities and so forth. And then will the response be actually to bail out the companies? I think we had you know, plenty of examples uh, at, um, what we've been discussing at the moment in the UK is, is the way that the UK government responded to the ending of the slave trade in, uh, in the 1830s and having to, to buy out the um, the slave owners, but also for the current example, the effect of COVID-19 on airlines and so forth. And so the response has been effectively to bail out the, the airlines rather than saying, well, in, in the longer term, um, your, your business is going to be down a lot anyway. So why not take advantage of it and let's, um, let's mm -hmm. scale back now. So I wonder if you could, whether this will lead on from looking at the stranded assets in terms of, of risk over to saying, well, let, let's bail them out because otherwise the financial uh, instability will follow. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. This is everything it seems we have now. So Romain, feel free to, to answer them. Yeah, th thanks a lot for the, these questions. They are, they are difficult and, and I, I prefer being very honest from, from the onset. Um, some of them are difficult to respond, not, not only because of my personal opinion, but also because of my role, and they really touch upon very controversial issues, though, although what I say obviously is not um, 
not uh, necessarily the, the views of Banque de France, but I'll try to, to join the, the question asked first by um, the first uh, question asked by Malcolm about um, central banks and investment bank, green QE, and the question that Mario asked about uh, Green New Deal with which role for central banks where uh, there are definitely some connections there. Um, so if you, if you look, uh, definitely the, the, the way, you know, like central banks are reacting to that is a very strong rejection to the, uh, any, um, any direct financing that's very clear in the way they address the issue. And especially, I would say, in the, in the euro system where you see that there's a, uh, it really goes against so the whole philosophy, I would say, the, of the euro system. And I'm not <laughs> judging here, just, uh, just uh, seeing uh, what's happening. So I would say that the, the, the issue here where uh, I don't want to engage into this, whether this is good or bad, because it's, it goes really against what, what I can do. But I would say that where I would disagree sometimes with this idea of like direct financing is needed or, you know, like green QE, et cetera, is really that um, I wouldn't say in a group like, like ours, but in, in the debate I, I see out there, it really comes from this idea that uh, it reinforces the idea that we only have monetary policy that fiscal policy does not exist. And in a lot of cases, you see that this is what's behind this. We don't have money. We are already at a high level of debt. So what can we do? We can create money. And I mean, I'm not saying that every, everyone says that, but in a lot of cases, this is really what informs the view that, you know, like that central banks should be creating money. And then I understand that it's also based on the fact that they are uh, uh, printing money for other purposes, et cetera. But it, it, that's where really I think we should be displacing the debate rather than asking uh, whether you know like this this is going to save us or not because that's uh, and, and making it even more difficult and responding to uh, to david's question i would say it really depends on what is a transition because if the transition is just about um just about you know having like big green fiscal policy uh, i would say we don't need to be like reinventing the wheel you know like we what we need is what some what ecological macroeconomists have already been proposing, what post keynesian scholars have been proposing, but trying to green it. Um, the problem is that uh, in high income economies, does it come with growth or does it come as an additional constraint to growth? And I believe, you know, like in a lot of sectors, if you want to develop like railroads uh, in Europe or in Canada, I mean, fine, that creates a lot of job, that creates a lot of demands. But what you want to do ultimately is replace like half of the cars you have as well. So, you know, like, and I think we should be somehow, I mean, that the, the idea sometimes I have in mind is like, we should be thinking about, you know, like crowding out in a crowding in world, you know, like where we know it's about crowding in, but, but somehow like the measure of success changes. Is it about, you know, like boosting GDP? Not necessarily. It's about really like diminishing the amount of personal cars. And that's, that's where, you know, like if you got there and you ask, okay, what is the role of central banks then? Uh, I'm sorry, David, I have no idea, but I don't know what the role of fiscal policy is either. <laughs> what, you know, like, what, what inequality should be acceptable. And that's really where ecological economists have been, I think, uh, bothering a lot over the past decades and being unheard until recently, where it becomes more and more obvious that we need to bring this idea of limits, not, you know, like, not in some sort of like Malthusian sense where, you know, like, oh, yeah, there are limits we can do now, but really as some sort of like self imposed limits, saying we're living way beyond in rich countries, beyond what, you know, like the planet can take as waste in a single year. So it's more like, I would say it's more a boundary than the limits. We can cross it, we're crossing it every day, and we should be careful. We should live, you know, like perhaps at a slower rhythm. That, so I'm sorry for being so. Uh, for escaping a little bit the question, but I, unfortunately, I think that's the only way I, I, I have to address it. Um, and yeah, and then um, perhaps very quickly, the, 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 I think two questions that I haven't addressed yet. The, the, the first one that Mario asked about, you know, like how come some central bankers insist so much on inflation targeting and in practice, you know, like prudential policy in some central banks becomes acceptable, climate change 90% of the literature on central banks and climate change, what who, like on the prudential angle and not on the, the you know, like an inflation targeting angle. Um, I've joined personally that I know I have a colleague who, who's there, Vincent, perhaps he has a, you know, like more history there. Uh, from what I see, it's, um, it's really related to the crisis itself, to the fact that, you know, like prudential policy became somehow like a financial stability became de facto part of the mandates. And that climate change, like the, the obvious point of entry for climate change was through financial stability. It becomes very difficult to, uh, although there are some first reports, but to, 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 to say how it could impact 
your rate of interest, whether it's like a natural one or not, that's another discussion, but you know, like trying to determine that is even more difficult than saying, look, this could be a systemic risk. It, you know, like you can, you can make the case more easily. So I, I think, but I mean, that, that would require some sort of like a sociology of organization to understand how it really, uh, how it really work. And I don't have it because I joined to work, the, I joined the Banque de France to work on this specific issue. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, that, that relates to the question of standard assets. Um, yeah, I'm afraid that, um, I mean, Mark Carney, if you look at his speech, uh, the first speech that basically kicked off the whole uh, debate of climate change and central banks, there are some beautiful parts on it. And I think one of them, he talks about the tragedy of the horizon. That's actually even the name of the speech. And I would say that, you know, like all other things being equal, although we know that it's bailing out um, fossil fuel companies um, or, you know, like triggering a financial crisis, there would be a strong preference to, um, to bail them out. I think that's, uh, that's, you know, like there's no doubt and that's not only for central banks, it's for any player. Uh, this being said, there's the question of, we, we talk about that in the green swan, if you bail them out, I mean, you have assets that in practice, they should never recover because you should never be able to touch them again. So it's interesting, this, uh, this question that uh, Malcolm asked, I mean, this point he raised about, you know, like um, um, after like uh, colonial periods where uh, were the assets that were permanently, um, you know, like um, uh, written down and that we never recovered. Or could we do that? Uh, should we do that with regard to 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 climb to fossil fuel assets? So these are these are questions that are uh, extremely difficult. But that's also why I think it's so important to have like this this strong coordination. Where if you have that, but at the same time you have a bunch of jobs creating a transition, at least you're offsetting some some of these issues. So again, I would say it's um, I don't have you know like a a number. Even when you look at the number of solid assets, it could go for like four trillions to twenty trillions. Like it goes, you know, like you have no idea of how much they're worth, uh, how cask how they could cascade down. So that's a, that's a big question. I think a frightening one that uh, unfortunately is very related to, to this tragedy of the horizon. That if you don't do anything, most of the risk will happen later on. And if you want to do something, you may be triggering the the risk yourself. So that's uh, this tension we, we we all face. I think today. That's all, Romain? Yeah, I think I'll stop here because okay, I see so, that I'm speaking way too much. <laughs> okay, so thank you for, for the presentation and, and the answers. We will now go to the second present, presentation from Yanis Daphromos. He is a lecturer in economics at SOAS University of London. He is also a member of the Center for Sustainable, Sustainable Finance. His research focuses on financial macroeconomics, climate change and finance, ecological macroeconomics, shadow banking, and inequality. He is currently acting as the principal investigator in a project on the greening of the euro system collateral framework, funded by Inspire Climate Works Foundation. And before he begins, I want to tell a brief history that happened at four years ago between a master's degree student and a professor. This master's degree student was struggling to, to develop his stock flow consistent model and write his thesis. And he asked for help for a professor who very kindly exchanged lots and lots of email with him. And the student is me and the professor is Daphromos. So I want to, to thank you because this is the first time we see each other in person. So thank you, Professor, for, for all the help you gave me back then. There would be no master degree nor master thesis for me without your help back then. So thank you for that. You are very much welcome. And uh, I hope that this was an opportunity for you to engage with the stock flow ecosystem models. Because we always have these problems that it's very difficult to go into this type yeah. of modeling. So very nice to meet you and uh, many thanks both to you and uh, Louis Philippe for the invitation to present today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, so I'm going to follow up uh, on many of the issues that Roman has already actually described. And uh, first of all, can you see my slides? Is everything fine? Yeah, we can see. It. Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about federal banking and climate change. And actually, I'm going to uh, argue that uh, we need to see this issue through what I call a systems-based approach, which is close to what Roman described before, 
and I will explain that this is close also to ecological and post Keynesian economics. Uh, so my, my purpose is actually to provide a more theoretical perspective to the debates that we have right now about climate change and central banking. And as Roman described before, uh, we, we see what has happened over the last few years in, in, in the literature on climate change and also in the policies around climate, uh, sorry, central banking. Uh, we have seen a big change. I mean, nowadays uh, there is a kind of consensus that central banks have to address climate change issues. And the, the big question is uh, how exactly to do that. But as Roman said before, it's, we have seen the development of this network for greening the financial system, NGFS. Uh, and uh, the, key reasons behind, behind, the key reasons why we have this consensus is that, as Roman described before, first, Central banks have realized that uh, the transmission channels of monetary policy can be affected by climate change. So when we are talking about inflation targeting, they have realized that they cannot actually target inflation without taking into account uh, transition and physical risks. And at the same time, and probably most importantly, uh, it has been recognized that since we have the transition and fiscal risks to the financial system, central banks need to address uh, them. So we have this consensus that central banks should now not ignore climate change, but the, the, there is no consensus on how central banks should do that. So uh, the key question is, should central banks just try to measure climate risks uh, and then reflect uh, these risks into their policies? Or should they try to play a more active role to, in order to promote the transition to a low-carbon economy. There is a, a quite intense debate with respect to that over the last two years or so. So what I'm going to do is to compare uh, two different views on central banking and climate change. I'm going to call the first view the risk pricing approach and the other view the systems-based approach. Uh, and let me exp uh, clarify that uh, it's not that everyone is in favor of the one view or the other. You can see that some people might be in favor of the risk pricing approach, but they also uh, uh, agree with some arguments of the systems-based approach. But what is crucial is to understand that these two different approaches have many different implications about the way that central banks should uh, act in terms of climate change. So uh, I will first present briefly uh, what I mean when I say uh, when I refer to the risk pricing approach. Uh, then I will explain the differences with the systems-based approach. And then I will move on to discussing some challenges that we might face when we want to, to implement a systems-based approach. Uh, actually, Roman has already covered some of these challenges, but I'm going to, to focus on a few more. Uh, and then I will conclude. So, the risk pricing approach. Uh, this approach, uh, in my view, is very much related with the main idea of environmental economics, uh, which is a mainstream way of understanding the interaction between the economy and the environment. And this is that we have right now a kind of market failure. And this market failure has to do with the fact that we, uh, we do not consider the environmental externalities. Now, if you look at the tradition of environmental economics, the market failure has to do with the fact that, for example, we do not uh, take into account that carbon emissions create climate change, and this then has negative feedback effects on the economy. And in that sense, what they suggest is that we need to price uh, carbon in order to solve the problem. Now, this can be extended to the financial markets. And the idea here is that financial markets and central banks have failed to price in climate risks. So the, 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 the main argument is that so far, financial institutions have not taken into account this uh, market failure. And as a result of that, uh, we, we have an externality that needs to be addressed. So this is a first starting point. And for many people, uh, if we find a way to address this market failure, then that's all. We don't need to do anything more. And I think this is a view that is, is supported by many uh, people who work in central banks. Now, the second proposition uh, is that uh, any type of climate risk is there, exists, is important, but uh, central banks do have no impact on these climate risks. 
And I, I would say that this is a kind of an implicit proposition within this approach, uh, because the idea is that central banks have to measure the risks, but it is not recognized that the way that central banks act might have an impact on these risks. So based on these propositions, which are the main policy implications? The first one is that central banks need to, to take action in order to help financial markets to measure uh, climate risks. And they also need to help financial markets to uh, reflect these risks. And the second policy implication is uh, that central banks also have to take this into account and they have to incorporate climate risks into their operations. But crucially, they have to find a way to do that uh, without violating the market neutrality principle. So in many, in many discussions with uh, people who work in central banks, you will understand that they would agree with the idea that, we, that uh, central banks should analyze and reflect climate risks, but in any case, they should not uh, being consistent with the market neutrality principle. And let me uh, provide you with some examples uh, that have to do with the way that this risk pricing approach could be implemented in practice. So uh, the first one is about uh, QE, and I, I basically refer here to corporate QE. So the idea is that uh, central banks have to find a way to measure climate risks, once they have done so, and they have realized that there are some specific assets, let's say of some fossil fuel companies, that are considered to have high transition risks, then this might be necessary to be reflected in uh, the purchases of central banks, and maybe central banks should not purchase risks, that, uh, sorry, assets that are considered to be of high climate risk. Uh, the same logic can apply to the collateral framework. The collateral framework is uh, the way through which central banks decide about the assets that can be used as a collateral when commercial banks want to get liquidity from uh, the central banks. So uh, for example, in the, in the Euro system, we have that the ECB decides about the assets that can be used as a collateral. And on top of it, of, the, of it they also uh, identify haircuts for each of these collaterals. Now, the higher the haircut, the, 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 the less the amount of liquidity that the commercial bank can get by using a specific asset. Uh, so for example, uh, five years ago, when we had the, the, the crisis in Greece, the haircuts of uh, the uh, green, Greek bonds were extremely high. And in some cases, they, would, they could not be accepted as a collateral. So uh, this is a quite powerful framework that has many second round effects. Uh, on the financial markets. And if we want to apply the risk pricing approach here, the idea would be to adjust the haircuts in order to take into account climate risks. And finally, uh, the, I have here the example of financial regulation. So if someone wants to apply the idea of risk pricing in financial regulation, uh, what could we have there? Uh, we could have the proposal of increasing capital requirements for uh, loans or bonds that are of high climate risks. Uh, now, uh, what is interesting is that so far the discussion on, uh, in, this, in this risk pricing approach with respect to the way that this can be applied to central bank policies has mostly focused on transition risks. And what does it mean? It means that we, in, in most cases, if central banks reflect these climate risks, there might be a positive effect because those companies that pollute more uh, might be negatively uh, uh, adversely affected by that. However, when we're talking about climate risks, we refer both to transition and physical risks. So something that could happen later if we apply this approach is that this can be extended to physical to, to physical risks and uh, this might be a, a bit problematic in what sense uh, you might have companies that uh, are in areas that, that could be affected a lot by climate change uh, or they might uh, are they might be in countries that are very uh, vulnerable to climate change now in that case what we might see is that these companies 
uh, might face higher uh, interest rates because of the fact that they might be penalized by uh, central banks. So when we extend this approach to physical risks, things might become uh, a bit more problematic. So we have to take this into account uh, because uh, it might happen if you, if you use this uh, risk pricing approach. Now, let me turn to what I call uh, a systems-based approach. And as I said before, this is in line with, in my view, with post-Keynesian and ecological economics. And uh, the starting point of this approach is that climate risks depend on very complex interactions between different types of systems. And here I'm referring primarily to the ecosystem, the macroeconomy, and the financial system. Uh, and uh, we cannot actually understand this risk without understanding uh, these types of interactions. So this is very much in line with what uh, Roman said before. But I would like to uh, focus a bit on what I call here Proposition 2, uh, which is that uh, it's not actually sufficient for central banks to recognize uh, that we have this complexity, but they also have to acknowledge that they are part of a system of, this, of these different systems, and therefore the climate risks are not exogenous to what they do. Uh, and here I have some examples. So uh, when we have the settled banks, as they do right now, uh, buy corporate bonds that have been issued by fossil fuel companies, uh, they implicitly support these companies uh, because they can reduce uh, the interest rates for them. And they can also give a signal to the financial markets about these companies. And this means that despite the fact that this is not their main purpose, at the end of the day, they do not allow the reduction of, of carbon emissions. And in the long run, this is not good because it means that they contribute to, to higher physical risks. The same holds when we have that central banks include in their collateral frameworks carbon intensive assets. We know that this is the case and we can find many carbon intensive bonds in the collateral frameworks. And the problem with that is that uh, uh, these companies, these fossil fuel companies, for example, can get a very nice treatment in the repo markets, uh, which are very powerful nowadays. Why? Be because of the fact that they are part of the collateral framework. So again, in that sense, central banks do not have a neutral law when we're talking about uh, carbon emissions. And uh, we have now this idea, uh, which I think is, is, is very important and very useful too, to have some climate stress tests. Uh, but we have also to understand that if we have central banks uh, announce uh, some climate stress tests and they uh, say that uh, uh, these banks actually face high transition risks, this will have an impact in the financial markets. There will be reactions to that. And we also need to consider, broadly speaking, the political power of central banks and the signals that they give. So I'm not saying that these are the most important effects. And in, in, in a sense, as I will explain in a bit, uh, they might be quite minor compared to the role of government, compared to the role of uh, investment banks. Uh, but I think it's not correct within a systems-based approach to say that central banks do not actually have any impact and it's not necessary to do anything. So what, is a pol the, what are the policy implications from the systems-based approach? Uh, first, uh, if we want to use this approach, uh, we are actually implicitly closer to a kind of a climate-aligned macroprudential perspective. And in that sense, central banks do not only have to measure climate risks, but they should also contribute to the reduction of transition and physical risks. And uh, very crucially, and this is policy implication too, uh, they have to do so in a way that uh, uh, allows them to interact with other policies. So, uh, uh, this is very much in line with what Roman said before. Uh, when central banks, for example, decide to, to support some corporate uh, green bonds, the effect will be extremely different in an environment where the government does not actually support green investment compared to the case in which the government actually doesn't do anything in order to, to, to promote this type of investment. Uh, when we have that central banks just uh, change their, central, their tools in order to promote the transition to a low, to a low carbon economy, the effect uh, on financial stability in the long run will be very low 
if there is no coordination with fiscal and industrial policies. But since we are in a system whereby the, we have so many interactions, uh, the starting point is that central banks uh, need to act together with other uh, institutions. Uh, we do not have to, es to escape uh, from the fact that central banks are, are important. Now, in practice, uh, what does this uh, approach imply? Uh, and I'm going to use the examples that I used before for the risk pricing approach. So when we are talking about the corporate QE, and I, I, to, just to be clear, I, I, uh, I'm not in, in favor of the, view, of the view that we have to, to have a green QE for government bonds. I'm focusing here only on the, on the corporate QE. And the idea of the system-based approach is that uh, central banks should take into account that they buy some carbon intensive assets and if they want to, to reduce the risk that, com that comes from climate change, they should stop uh, doing so. And at the same time, there is a potential for them to, to buy some green assets in order to, to reduce yields related to, for example, to green bonds. In the case of the collateral framework, the starting point is not to reflect risks, but it is to, uh, again, to increase haircuts related with carbon intensive companies, probably to exclude carbon intensive assets, and at the same time to consider the possibility of supporting a little bit more uh, some uh, companies that seem to contribute to the transition to a low carbon economy. And in the case of financial regulation, uh, I mean, there is a very strong argument that right now uh, we s it is necessary to increase a lot the capital requirements related to, to brown assets, not only because they have high risks. From a system-based approach, it is necessary to do so because the support of these carbon intensive assets is, is very bad for climate change, is very bad for uh, physical uh, climate risks. Uh, and again, there might be an argument about uh, low requirements for green assets, although from the system-based approach, we need to think carefully about the financial stability effects of, of doing so. Now, uh, if we want to implement the systems-based approach, there will be many challenges. Uh, the first one is that actually we still don't know how exactly to define uh, which assets are, assets are dirty and which are green. Now, uh, very recently, the EU taxonomy uh, has been developed. Uh, this is a, a taxonomy that has been promoted by the European Commission. And it's a kind of way of identifying which assets are green and which are not. Now, this can be a starting point, but let me emphasize that uh, this approach has some limitations. Limitation number one, uh, it's a binary approach. Uh, this means that an asset is either green or it is not green. And does it take into account that the reality we might have different degrees of greenness? Uh, and second, uh, if you look at which activities are considered to be green, you will find many carbon intensive activities which are considered to be potentially green if the companies and manage to reduce their carbon density. Now, the problem with that is that it, it reduces a kind of greenwashing. And uh, I, I think we have to be very careful with that. Uh, now, the EU taxonomy doesn't uh, do anything about identifying what is dirty. And this is important because if we want to achieve the transition to a low carbon economy, we need to know which companies are dirty and which are not. Uh, now, one way to do that is to use the uh, classification that we have for different sectors and identify specific uh, sectors, for example, based on the NAIS four bit classification, uh, in order to uh, say which companies uh, are more carbon intensive than others. And there are people who have worked on that over the last years. Uh, we can also uh, rely on data that we have for companies about emission intensity. And despite the fact that we still do not have enough data to do so, uh, we have some information in order to be able to talk about uh, dirtiness. And there's a very interesting debate about uh, forward looking and whether we need to have to define greenness and dirtiness based on forward looking 
the idea here is that many companies have to uh, make the transition to a low carbon production and therefore we need to take into account their plans and again uh, my concern is that uh, despite the fact that i i agree with a forward-looking perspective uh, we might have a problem of greenwashing why because we might uh, rely on plans that will not take place and in that sense uh, i think it's important to have a dynamic perspective but we first need to see that firms actually have done things in order to to be less carbon intensive and then probably to support them the other way around might might be a bit risky uh, now i would like to present you quickly some data about the recent uh, corporate key program of the bank of england and this is a work that we have recently done uh, with uh, my colleagues and what we have done is that we have analyzed uh, the list of bonds that can be bought by the bank of england based on uh, the recent QE program and we have identified primarily using the NACE four digit classification uh, which of these bonds uh, have been issued by carbon intensive sectors which of these bonds have been issued by potentially uh, uh, green sectors and which of them actually are, are have been issued by sectors that are either that are not green and neither uh, carbon intensive now the first thing to to say here is that if you look at the first uh, column uh, which refers to the current quantitative easing program about 55 percent of the bonds that are in the bank of england list for the corporate qe have been issued by carbon intensive companies and there is only quite small proportion that uh, has to do with uh, companies that engage uh, a bit with uh, renewables and other green projects uh, in that sense uh, one could say that there is a potential for for the bank of england to to reduce this carbon footprint and we have considered a case uh, which is reflected in the second column whereby the bank of england decides to exclude fossil fuels and energy intensive sectors from the from the qe and this is why you see a reduction in uh, in the brown uh, part of the of the of the of the bar and at the same time uh, we have identified some bonds that more or less are in line with the criteria of the bank of england but have been issued by sectors that have a higher green potential and the bank of england can do that quite uh, easily and by doing so it can reduce its uh, uh, carbon footprint and in the last column what we have done is that we have excluded all the sectors that are carbon intensive and we have actually included some sectors that uh, are not green but at the same time have very low uh, contribution to, to emissions and in that case we have that the carbon footprint of the bank of england program uh, is uh, can be reduced a lot so uh, what i want to say with this example is that although this is a very preliminary way of doing this type of analysis it means that there are ways for central banks to reduce their negative effect on, on emissions. And it doesn't mean that this will be a huge change, but it can contribute to, uh, to, the, to the change that we have to make. Uh, now, I, I will finish uh, by uh, referring to two uh, challenges very quickly. The, the one is that if central banks uh, decide to take action to reduce physical risks, we need coordination not only with other institutions but also with other countries the climate change is a global problem uh, if we have that all central banks want to reduce their carbon footprint uh, this has to take place at the same time otherwise the contribution to the reduction of emissions will be uh, very low and in my view uh, since we have now ngfs which is a net great network uh, there could be a potential for NGFS to coordinate uh, such types of actions. And finally, the other challenge is that, of course, uh, when central banks try, for example, to exclude carbon intensive companies, uh, this will be great for reducing the physical risks, but this might be at the expense of increasing some transitional risks. For me, this is fine. I mean, we need to have the transition. But what is important is that uh, we can actually 
address some transition risks that might be caused by central bank interventions, how by having collaboration, sorry, coordination with other policies, this can be other financial green supporting policies or more crucially, uh, climate fiscal policies. Uh, and if, if someone does uh, looks at that and, and see the potential of uh, having policy mixes, I think it's quite clear that this is how we can contribute uh, much more importantly to the reduction of, of emissions. So there is a lot of room for, for, for thinking about uh, interactions. So to conclude, uh, I just wanted to explain uh, the different views that uh, I have seen in the debates about civil banking over the last uh, years. Uh, as I said, there are uh, many people who are in favor of the risk pricing approach. My main concern is that central banks might spend a lot, a lot of time in order to find the best way to capture the climate risks, and they might not do anything until they find a very nice way of doing so. In practice, this means that they will not take action probably for the next four or five years, and for me, this is not good. If we use a system-based approach, the starting point is that central banks are part of the system. Uh, we need, of course, to point out that they cannot replace any kind of uh, fiscal policy or industrial policy, uh, but they also need to contribute to, to the change that, that we need. Uh, okay, and I think I'll stop uh, here and very happy to, to discuss uh, lots of issues during the Q&A. Thank you, Yanis, for your presentation. We already have a raised hand from Vincent. So, Yanis, if you can please stop your, your, your screen sharing. Just, yeah. just, okay, thank you. So, Vincent, you can ask your question since you already raised your hand. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much first for the presentation. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and it uh, nicely uh, it was a nice compliment to a woman presentation, uh, I thought. Um, I would have to, yeah, two, two questions. The first one, very uh, quick, even if it's a difficult one, but just a bit more details on the methodology on slide uh, uh, 11. Um, you mentioned the methodological issues to, um, um, to properly um, um, take into account the carbon uh, intensive um, corporates uh, when uh, selecting them for the QE programs. So I wonder how you managed to uh, get around this, uh, this for the, um, the, the Bank of England uh, study you, you did. And the second question um, would be, so yeah, I, I, I also uh, be uh, involved in this NGFS uh, work for, for Bank de France. So I am very glad actually that many post Canadian uh, economists are, are involved. That's very, that's very good. Um, and I wanted to, um, to ask you on, a, so you mentioned in the, um, what you go, what you call the system-based approach and that we also can uh, call maybe the, the, the kind of proactive uh, uh, dimension uh, of, the, of, of the central bank action. Um, to what extent do you identify other type of action? You mentioned uh, kind of inclusion versus the, the exclusion uh, policy uh, in, the, in the risk uh, um, approach. Um, so uh, be it for the, the purchases, uh, the collateral, and also regulation. Uh, but uh, did you also discuss some other ideas uh, on instruments, for example, uh, uh, some, type of, some type of targeting, or is it really uh, based on this uh, inclusion of, of green assets or green, uh, yeah, a bit in the collateral or, or the um, asset purchase framework? Thank you. Thank you, Vincent, for your question. Louis Philippe wants to, to, to ask a question. Yes, I don't know how to raise my hand. Apart from it doesn't that. appear for hosts. I don't know why, but we cannot raise our hands. Yeah, I do have a, a, a question. I've been uh, reading up on uh, climate change recently. Um, and one of the, I would not call it a consensus, 
but certainly one of the opinions out there is that uh, it's too late. So uh, my question is, uh, if it is too late, then how do you reconcile what you're talking about or what then becomes the role of the central bank? Uh, is there a role for the central bank? Or is your analysis based exclusively on the idea that it's not too late, we can still save the planet? Thank you. Thank you, Louis Philippe. We don't have any other raised hands. So, Yanis, if you can please answer the questions. Oh, wait, David raised his hand right now. So, David, please ask your question. And then I pass over to Yanis. You're muted, David. We cannot hear you. Pardon me. Uh, Yanis, I can understand, and thank you for your paper. I, I, I like uh, to learn, I like the aspect of learning more about activities within uh, the, the English banking system. Um, it seems that if we're a specialist or interested in money and banking and finance, that our view of uh, the sector is that we should recommend policies to change it internally. And uh, I, I want to say that because of the backwardness of this sector, and particularly the economic interests that have captured it, what do you think the role of uh, specialists in this area is to judge the possibility for financial policy even to be capable of addressing the issue. Maybe specialists should draw the conclusion that it's not possible for effective action to be worked out through the financial system and that policy has to be to limit the damage that the financial system can do and deal with other forces within the state or society that can make the change. So there is this kind of underlying assumption that some things can be done that are significant by the financial system. And I sort of raised this a little bit with Romain. I, I think that the position of specialists has to be to look at their sector, like somebody who specializes in mining or somebody who specializes in um, petroleum or whatever, to see, is it really the sector that the change is going to come from? And to tell people that this is not going to be the agent for any major structural change. Because listening to what you're saying, I don't get a good feeling about the possibilities. That's just my intuition. I haven't played them through, but that's my feeling. And I'm just asking you about your role as a specialist in this area. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your question. So now question window closed. So Yanis, please, it's up to you. Okay, thank you so much for all very interesting questions. Uh, le let me start uh, very quickly with uh, the question of uh, Louis Philippe. Uh, I mean, uh, we know that if we want to achieve 1.5 degrees, uh, or probably 2 degrees, uh, it's, it's probably already too late. Uh, I, I, the carbon budget is extremely small and it's very difficult to, to, to achieve changes that are going to, to, to keep uh, carbon emissions within that budget. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's very, uh, what we have done so far is, is, is extremely bad. We haven't taken into account this problem at all. Uh, but I mean, uh, for me, it still makes sense to try to achieve at least 2.5 degrees instead of 3 degrees. I mean, I know this is not good, uh, but I don't think that we can say that because it is too late, you know, uh, we cannot actually change uh, what is going to happen. We have to do our best recognizing that uh, now the problem is, is extremely bad. Uh, now, uh, my presentation focused on, on federal banking and climate change. Uh, uh, but to be honest, I'm, I'm uh, a post Keynesian, I'm, uh, that's why I, I said at the beginning that for me, industrial policy, fiscal policy, and uh, all, all those aspects that have to do with uh, the way that uh, we live and, you, and we use and we consume. 
are much more important uh, than what central banks can do. However, I think we have to recognize that there has been a huge change in the distribution of power over the last decades and we have seen a lot of uh, redistribution of power towards the financial system. And in a sense, central banks reflect this change. Uh, so for me, it's not important. So despite the fact that for me, it's, it's more important to look into the different industries, to work with other disciplines and understand how exactly the production processes can change. And then we have to think about the environmental regulation. We have to think about the way that the fiscal policy can support uh, the changes that we need in the industrial sector. These are extremely important things and we have to do them and this should be the priority. But I don't think that we have to pretend that central banks also play a political role in the current system. And it's not only you know, to just change a bit the corporate QE, to change the collateral framework, uh, it's also, uh, for me, it's important to, to, to talk about central banking because if, if central banks accept, as a result of the discussion about climate change, that they are not neutral, that they play a political role, that they have supported uh, dirty companies so far, I think this is a good starting point in order to, to talk about broader changes that we need. And I think it's also a good starting point in order to say that central banks need to uh, interact more uh, with governments and other institutions and we need it's a way for me to to get rid of this neutrality and independence uh, principles so this is why i think it's, it's important it's not only about the economic arguments uh, uh, now uh, i probably don't have so much time to go into the details about how exactly we have worked on the corporate qe program uh, but very quickly to, to explain what we have done, uh, we, uh, we take the, the list of bonds that have been announced by the Bank of England and then uh, we use uh, two things. First, the classification of sectors uh, in different activities. We use the, the more detailed classification whereby we can identify uh, which companies engage with activities that are more carbon intensive. Uh, and we use some standard classifications in, in the literature. And, and then the other thing that we do is that we look also at carbon density. So when, for example, we want to include a bond uh, uh, in order to replace a fossil fuel based bond, uh, what we do is that we look uh, at the carbon density of the company. If the carbon density is relatively low and the company is in a sector that has a potential to contribute to, to green activities, then we say that it's better to include this and exclude uh, a positive uh, a base bond. Uh, but I, I probably I don't have time to, to go into more details. We are going to publish a brief on that and very happy to send this to you, Vincent. Uh, we will do that next week, most uh, likely. And very quickly, I, in terms of policies, I mean, I just provided some examples. Uh, Roman also referred to other broader policies that uh, central banks can uh, engage with. So I, I talked about the collateral framework, financial regulation, and corporate QE, uh, uh, but there are broader ways through which central banks can contribute to the, to the low carbon economy. So in line with what I have said, this is very much welcome, uh, 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 given that we take into account all the potential uh, uh, negative effects and positive effects of these actions. And uh, for me, in terms of policies, it's much, it's, it's much more interesting to start talking about interactions with other types of policies than just saying, please have a green QE or please have a green collateral. It's better to, to say that our starting point is that governments should uh, introduce public investment, should uh, introduce a new type of industrial policy that is going to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy, and then to think about the way that the financial system can support these, uh, these policies by the government. Uh, and not the other way around, to start from central banks and then to say, okay, let's have the government uh, do something more. The starting point should be, uh, should be there. Okay, but uh, I, I probably don't have so, so much time, so I'll stop here. Many thanks for, for your questions. Okay, thank you, Yanis, for your presentation. And 
the answers. We will now proceed to the last presentation by Louis Onka and Fouho. Sorry if I mispronounced it, Louis Onka. He is a postdoc researcher and assistant professor at the Institute for Ecological Economics of the Vienna University of Economic and Business. He holds a PhD in economics from Sorbonne Paris Nord University. And before that, he completed master's degrees in sustainable development in transition and developing countries from University of Auvergne, Sergi in international economics. Sorry for my very bad French. So, Luizon, please, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Silvio. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Are you going to share slides? No, I'm not going to share slides because I don't have slides. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Silvio and Louis Philippe, for organizing this webinar. Um, so, I have to uh, warn everyone, I will probably be uh, shorter than uh, Romain. And Yanis, uh, but that's good because I've said already a lot of things, so it will avoid uh, redundancies. And I will also be much more messy uh, because I'm kind of the last uh, last bit addition to the to the webinar. And also, uh, I'm going to expose, uh, generally speaking, the ideas that I want to develop in the chapter for the book. Uh, and it's very it's very much in the making. So I'm also looking forward for your for, for your feedback. So I'm sorry, uh, apologize in advance if it sounds sometimes a bit. Uh, Disorganized. So essentially, what I, what I want to do in this uh, in this chapter is both to to take a bit stock of the current state of the discussion um, in terms of where we stand uh, in green monetary policies, and also to take stock of the discussion regarding uh, ecological monetary economics to some extent. Then I also uh, I also want to uh, discuss a bit what what should be the role of a central bank in an ecological society, and uh, I want to link this question with the nature of money as a as a social relation. I think it's very important that we uh, that we come back uh, that we come back to this, and I uh, also uh, within this framework discuss three uh, kind of monetary policies, which I think uh, could be at the core of uh, an ecological central, central bank, so to say. And as uh, Roman said in his presentation, I don't think there is a need to reinvent the wheel in that regard. I think the monetary uh, history, the history of monetary policy is full of tools that may seem today uh, very much exotic, but that were completely mainstream at some time and who, are, who could be very useful today. Uh, so I will, uh, I will briefly uh, tell you a bit uh, uh, in turn, what I intend to say in each of uh, each of these parts, just to uh, to be uh, transparent, the, the the context I have in mind while uh, while writing this uh, this chapter is that essentially, uh, as, as it's been said already a bit uh, in the discussion after uh, Yanis' presentation, uh, is that if we look at greenhouse uh, greenhouse gases data, there is no green growth in sight. If we look at biodiversity data. There is no green growth in sight. And if we look at material flows data, that is a physical data that measures the materiality of economies. And now we have a lot of data to develop a, a physical national accounting, a macroeconomics of material flows and stock to uh, contrast with the macroeconomics of monetary flows and stock. So if you look at those material flows data, there is no green growth in sight. Uh, and not only there is no green growth in sight, but we are going further away from the possibility of green growth. So th that I think is a context that we uh, very much need to have in mind when we tackle these issues, because I think the, the question when we think about what should be the role of a central bank uh, for an ecological society, the underlying question is essentially uh, the one of a social precaution mechanism. Essentially that is how do we organize society and some of its key institutions like central bank how do we organize uh, society and those key institutions in a way that society doesn't need growth anymore to be stable socially and politically? So perhaps we will manage to have green growth uh, one day, but we don't know. And so far, there is no data to ground a scientific discourse on, the, on green growth empirically. Uh, so the, the underlying context is this one, is the one that we, 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 we should probably acknowledge the fact that growth is something of the past, at least for high income economies, for high income societies, if we want to be serious environmentally speaking. 
Um, and the key question, therefore, or what is really at stake uh, when we narrow down the question to, uh, to the central bank and to, to money is uh, really the, the one, the key question, what is at stake is the, the one of the emergence of a new monetary regime as an indispensable, like, uh, as a key feature, as a crucial feature of a new accumulation or de-accumulation regime. Because I think regulation theory, and here I'm drawing in particular from the works of uh, Robert Gutmann, for instance, uh, regulation theory have shown that there is no emergence of a new mode of regulation uh, without the emergence of a new monetary regime. And of course, uh, in this, uh, the central bank has a key, uh, key role to play because it will be at, at, at the core of the new, uh, of the new monetary regime. So this is a bit to uh, explain, like, this is how I will contextualize the, uh, the chapter. Uh, then I go on to a uh, bit take stock of the uh, of the current state of the discussion, and that was also to uh, a bit uh, respect uh, the initial uh, demand of uh, Louis Philippe. So Louis Philippe asked me to uh, to write a chapter a bit uh, in the in line with the paper that we wrote with Marc Lavoie in 2016, who is a, a critic of what uh, some uh, ecological economists say about the link between monetary creation and growth. Essentially, there is this still widespread belief that if you create money at the debt with interest bearing interest, you create some sort of growth imperative because you never have enough money in the circuit. So you need to continuously create new money uh, and that's obliged to grow uh, uh, the economy to grow, otherwise it doesn't grow. So now there is a, a series of papers, including the one uh, from Mark and I, which have shown that this is not, uh, this is not true. But this has implication for the way we conceptualize monetary policy uh, in an ecological economic framework, of course. Because if this were to be true, then we would need almost to get rid of interest rates. So we show that this is not this is not uh, this is not necessary. And so I, I, I link this discussion to uh, to, the, to the current discussion on, on green monetary policies. Now there are several papers which uh, which list a little bit the, all the all the uh, the policies that are already implemented, being implemented today by a number of central banks worldwide. Uh, in particular, central banks from uh, middle-income countries or developing countries. Uh, so there is a paper, or, well, I think two papers by Emanuele Compiglio, who, uh, who lists a number of, uh, of green monetary policies. There is also a recent paper by um, Paola Dorazio and uh, Lili Popoyan. Uh, they have like created a, a database of green macroprudential uh, poli policies from which I, uh, from which I drew, uh, from which I drew in, the, uh, in the chapter. Now, I think a limit of, uh, of these discussions uh, so far is that they remain rather technical, which means uh, how, do we, how do we green or how do we make more green uh, what already exists? Uh, instead, uh, perhaps of going a bit deeper in terms of reconceptualizing what should be really a central bank for an ecological society, that is, the discussion is more about how do we greenify to some extent something that is not green. Uh, but perhaps we need to, uh, to go a bit uh, deeper than that. That's why I want, uh, I want to start the, this questioning on the role of central bank for an ecological society from the nature of money as a social relation. So what does it mean to say that money is a social relation? It's to recognize money as a link between decentralized producers uh, that enables different kind of economic activities to cohabit and in particular market and non-market activities. So if we start from this view of money, we can also say that money is a tool to reorient society or the economy in a way that can be uh, more sustainable. And of course, as institution managing money, uh, the central bank has a key role to play in this. And so how can the central bank do? And this is where I very much agree with Roman when he says there is no need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think we can use uh, three uh, tools that could be very powerful. The first one uh, is to use differentiated target interest rates. There is no reason why there should be only one target interest rate, and we could perfectly think that the central bank could target different interest rates depending on the level of sustainability of the activities. And uh, of course here, uh, that raises the question that uh, Yanis already discussed, so I won't come back uh, on this, but the, the question of the criteria of what is green, what is brown, and of the typology of, uh, of activities. And there is a, a real, uh, like a very, uh, Big important work to be uh, to be done about that, uh, and uh, uh, I am right now thinking about the possibility, for instance, to uh, implement to ensure that uh, the uh, the target interest rate would be different 
between sustainable and non-sustainable activities and would be sufficiently different because ultimately the aim is to uh, stop financing and non-sustainable activities. So we could imagine a transition period where the central bank would have different target interest rates and after a while, they would simply refuse to refinance certain kind of activities. It's not something that you can do from one day to another because uh, the, the banks uh, need to be ready for that, but you can implement a transition period with a, with a slowly rising target interest rate for non-sustainable activities. And at some point you say, when the target interest rate is at this level, we stop uh, refinancing those activities. And to ensure that the target interest rate would reach the adequate level, um, I'm thinking now about the mechanism of uh, in implementing on the uh, interbank market um, a merit order. You know, so for instance, uh, we have a merit order in the electricity market. That is the, the different uh, plant producing electricity that will be turned on in a given order, depending on some characteristics. So for instance, priority will be given to, uh, to a sustainable electricity, to a carbon free electricity. Then if it's not enough, they will turn on the gas plant and so on. You know? And we could have a, such a merit order on the monetary, uh, on the interbank market to ensure that the, the, uh, the, the market clears in a way that uh, benefits first and foremost sustainable activities. Uh, and that would, of course, uh, push uh, higher the interest rate for uh, non-sustainable, non -sustainable, for, for banks needing to refinance uh, non-sustainable uh, non -sust non activities. So that's the first uh, thing I, I, I'm discussing in the chapter, this possibility of differentiated target interest rate with a merit order on the internal market. The second thing uh, that I, I, I need to uh, I need to develop a bit further. I, I just started to, to think about that. Is uh, qualitative easing. I think qualitative easing can can be a very uh, very powerful uh, powerful tool uh, if we integrate uh, relevant environmental uh, criteria into the assessment of the quality of assets. And here I think it links strongly to what uh, Yanis and Romain said about uh, the need to integrate, of course, climate and environmental risk uh, in the in the asset in asset pricing. And of course, it echoes uh, the, the the mandate of the central banks uh, because there are strong um, threats on price stability if you take, if you don't take into account uh, the environmental, so to say, the environmental quality. Uh, and that is also, I think, uh, a good way to question this concept of market neutrality. The more I think about that, about that, the more I think this concept of market neutrality has make no sense whatsoever. Because what does it mean to be market neutral? It just means like you take the bond universe as it is and you try not to distort it. But in doing so, as uh, Yanis recalled, you, you will offer better financing conditions, for instance, for carbon, carbon intensive, intensive activities. So it is not market neutral after all, because you're pushing market uh, carbon intensive activities and you're fostering future feedback effects, climate or environmental effect, will affect the market itself. So I, I really think we need to deconstruct this concept of market neutrality because it is not social, it is not economic, and it is not environmentally neutral. So in the end, it is not even market neutral itself. And so I think there is a powerful case to be made also against uh, this market neutrality. So that's something I will uh, I intend to do as well when I will discuss the possibility for qualitative easing. And the third thing I want to discuss is uh, to, uh, to say that uh, I think and central banks today do it already in some countries, for instance in China, is to come back to uh, credit control and credit guidance. There is a very strong case to be made for credit control and guidance and it worked very effectively in high income countries in the past and in France we have a good example of this uh, with the French banking system of the uh, of the 50s and the 60s, for instance, and we need to do that, especially if we acknowledge money as a social relation, because credit guidance is a very strong way to foster the emergence of some ec economic activities over others, uh, and of, um, and so I, I think that would be a, that would be a very relevant tool, and I believe that the combination of those three tools uh, would be uh, would be very efficient at. Uh, um, shaping a new monetary policy for, for an ecological society. Now, of course, uh, I'm not sure I will have time to discuss it properly in the chapter, but it raises the question of the mandate uh, and of also of the legitimacy of central bank, uh, of central bank in doing so. But if we admit that money is endogenous both because 
the supply of money is endogenously determined, but also because uh, there is some kind of social endogeneity uh, of money, and on that I think Roman knows uh, better than I do, uh, then the institutions which manage money as a social relation need to follow the, the evolution of society. And now there is a growing demand, social demand, for radical environmental policies, for instance. So the question of uh, the legitimacy of central bank and of the independence of central bank will be uh, asked with more uh, strength, I think, in society. And right now, and it's very well explained by post Keynesian authors, like the central banks are a bit uh, limited to a defensive role, essentially. They have to uh, sustain the system as it is, and they have no choice, essentially, but to respond to refinancing needs, otherwise everything collapse. But therefore, it makes central bank dependent on the financial and economic system. So we need to restore balance, and the only way to do so is to make also uh, central bank political dependent. So that's the last point I think I will try to discuss if I have enough space. Uh, or at least uh, I will uh, try to open the discussion on that in the, um, in the conclusion. And I'm done, I think. Okay, thank you, Louison. Louis Philippe Rochon already raised his hand. So, Louis Philippe, please. Yeah, there's always been a concern of me when I read about these uh, ecological papers and now marrying them with monetary or, in case, in this also fiscal policy. Uh, the question is really to all three authors. Um, how do you reconcile your views with the degrowth literature? Because, you know, raise interest rates to 20% if you want to have degrowth and an impact on the environment, right? So um, that's my question. Okay, so the question is for all the, the authors and Let's start with Luizon because he's already on the stage. Uh, thanks, Rufi, for your question. I, I, sorry, I'm not so sure I understand totally your question. What do you mean? Like, you, how, you mean how do we reconcile the general post Keynesian view on endogenous money with degrowth? No, or... oh, no. Just your views about central bank policy mm -hmm. uh, with the literature. I mean, I'm not a fan, of course, of degrowth. But it is, uh, and, but some post-Keynesians are in favor of degrowth. So I guess what are, what are, what's your opinion of degrowth in the context of monetary policy or what you talked about today? Okay, uh, so for instance, if I draw from what I just said, for me, it depends also how you conceptualize degrowth, but uh, because there are some sectors that will need to degrow for the society to become sustain, uh, sustainable, but there are also some sectors that will need to grow. And I think here, uh, this is where, for instance, tools like qualitative easing or uh, credit guidance from the central bank is very useful because in using those tools, you can both foster the growth of the sectors who are deemed uh, useful or sustainable, and you can also uh, participate in organizing and financing the degrowth of the sector that will have to degrow. So I don't necessarily see a contradiction, but it depends how you, uh, you see degrowth. And I think if, if we read a bit closely the degrowth author, it's very clear that they, they, they insist on that, that some sector will have to grow, some other will have to degrow. So of course, at the end, in the aggregate, you can have degrowth, but it's, it's not the same as a, as a recession. And since it will need planification and organization, uh, the, those monetary policy tools, the central bank will have to play a role. So I, I don't, to be honest, I don't really see a contradiction. Okay. Thank you, Luison. Uh, Yanis, do you want to, to answer? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I mean, uh, I more or less agree with what Luison has said. Uh, but let me clarify that uh, first, we have a thing people talk about the growth uh, in, within a political economic context, and sometimes. Uh, the way that the growth is defined is, is not extremely, the same, extremely clear and it's not the same for everyone. So there, there are some political economy arguments about the need to take into account that we live in a finite plan and so much, and I agree with a broad argument about that. Now, when we want to talk about the growth in the sense of how GDP, uh, I mean, if we have to think about that, uh, it's necessary in the next uh, years or decades to increase public investment related to low carbon infrastructure. It's probably necessary to increase government spending in order to support not only environmental purposes, but also social purposes. 
So in that sense, we need to have a kind of increase in economic activity. Uh, but I think uh, an, a good point that comes from the growth arguments is that we also need to think carefully about our consumption. So if we find a way, for example, to restrict the carbon intensive consumption of rich people, uh, and if we find a way, for example, to rely more on public infrastructure in, instead of using our own cars, at least in big cities, in that sense, we can have a reduction in consumption, primarily a reduction in carbon intensive consumption, uh, which might be necessary in order to be closer to two degrees. So the way that I see the growth is by focusing primarily on the argument about the role of consumption and the social norms. And uh, I think it's important to point out that we need to have a change there. And we can use environmental regulation uh, and other types of uh, interventions in order to address that. But we cannot solve the problem by doing only that. We need to combine this uh, with uh, all the other policies that we have discussed today. And I'm talking more about that and, and, and fiscal policies. Uh, because if you think about that, if we don't change the, the share of renewables that we use in production, even if we have the growth and we have a lower level of, of GDP, we will still produce a lot of emissions. So it doesn't mean that by doing that, we, we solve the problem. Uh, but we should consider some arguments about uh, the reduction of consumption as part of the broader uh, policies that we need in order to, to achieve a transition in a low carbon economy. So in that sense, uh, I think that at the end of the day, we, we have to think carefully about the transition and to think about the way that we can combine policies. Uh, yeah, this is more or less my, my view on this. Thank you, Ionis. Romain? Yeah, so I, I, I'll be the, the radical guy here, although I, I am the one working for a central bank. But <laughs> no, actually, I think that uh, I, I basically agree with what Yanis uh, uh, and, and Luison just said, but um, I, I do think that degrowth, it's like it's the elephant in the room, really. I think we, we, we can't avoid talking about that. And you're like, and I'm saying that clearly not with my Bank de France hat here. It's really, you know, like what I see. It's interesting when I talk, you know, like uh, I'm working a lot on these uh, issues of climate scenario, et cetera. And for instance, when I talk to experts of, uh, there, there's a, a institution called ADEM in France, uh, the Agency for uh, Energy Control and the Environment. And when, when they look at the scenario, for example, like how do you use less cement? And you know, like I was talking to some of them, they're like, actually you could put, put whatever price you want on cement. There are no alternative technology. There's no this, there's no that. So what do you do? Well, you have to stop building secondary houses. So you need to have a different relationship to wealth, basically, to you know, like what the good life is. And to me, that discussion cannot be avoided. But that's for high income countries, right? It's, it's really like it's for high income countries that it is a big elephant in the room. If you all bet on kind of like on public investment or on, you know, like carbon pricing, if we're more on the neoclassical side or whatever it is, we're really missing something. And even with the idea of investment, we do need a bunch of green public investment, that's for sure. But to some extent, it's also, you know, like, um, it's a bad thing we need it in the, in the sense that in France, we have nuclear uh, electricity. Let's assume for the sake of the debate that it is good because it does, does not emit CO2. We can say about, you know, like the waste, whatever we want, but for CO2. So we need much, you know, like much fewer investments because we already have it. So, you know, like, so, so it brings this question of like, we don't need these investments. Oh, but it would be good to have like coal power plants so we could have green investments and boost the economy. So, and, but we don't need it. So we don't need to boost the economy on that stuff. So that really brings like all these questions that are extremely, extremely difficult and very few people are, are working on that or sometimes they work on that. But yeah, we, with perhaps what you're referring to, uh, Louis Philippe, with a view of, I don't know, like, yeah, what, what, what Yanis and Luison have said, like, oh, if we have, we degrow the economy, everything would work. And that's not the case at all, right? But, but that brings the question of, for instance, if degrowth was needed, whether it is in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, um, what do you do? Well, you could, you know, like raise interest rate to 25%, as you, as you said, but you, that's, that's more recession. What you could do is you could say you keep very low interest rates, but you have a, some sort of like quantitative control of credit where credit goes. Uh, you could have negative interest rate on wealth being detained, kind of like some sort of like Gazelian, you know, like Silvio Gazelle, kind of like a negative interest rate. So, 
And these are the discussion where I think that um, if we wanted to talk about the idea that an ecological society needs at some point to be growing or not growing, um, these are the elephants in the room. I don't know how you can have capital accumulation if you know like finance doesn't find opportunities in the real economy and you don't want this degrowing economy to be a financialized degrowing economy. And this brings like huge questions on how you, that, that's why I refer to this idea of like, what is a, an ecological uh, mode of regulation of capitalism? And I, I, I have no idea. And I find the responses so far um, very insufficient. Um, but, but I think that, yeah, th these are questions that, you know, like, I agree with Yanis. First, we need to have a lot of investment, so let's do them. And this, this is going to boost the economy. But we need to be thinking about these issues. And, and, and I think, yeah, I think we have quite a few elephants in the room once we get there. Um, since there's a silence, I'll take advantage of it. <laughs> the question I asked before about if it's too late, right, then the objective changes. It's no longer about growing or degrowing the economy to save or, you know, it then becomes on how to live with climate disaster. So it's about better building, it's about better design, it's about, so you are talking about a massive public investment in order to make ourselves um, coexist with climate change. Mm. Um, and this is sort of where I was going. So in fact, we're talking about more growth, but better growth or coexisting growth. I, I, I don't know what to call it. Well, that's, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a specialist and I, they're just thoughts. David Ledbeater has a question. Well, just on your last point, Louis Philippe, there's been a trench warfare going on for decades on the mitigation issue. I mean, uh, the issue of gas pipelines, there's constantly been people saying, uh, do we pump out the gas and kind of deal with the consequences and live with it or stop it? And, and I think that debate is gone, it's no longer serious. Uh, this, the consequences of not doing something fundamental are so grave that there's no question of coexistence. And it'll be worse for people who are least able to, to uh, uh, economically uh, to, to um, support their own conditions. Um, let me just say, it, Louison, that uh, you say there's no green growth in sight. I agree. And I think you make a very important reference to the, the, the issue of uh, material balances. I, I feel we're coming to this question, and by the way, in economics, uh, in environmental economics stuff, there's very little discussion, even in some of the mainstream textbooks, of material balances, of input-output tables, and in an area that I'm interested in, mining. Okay, and a lot of the green energy proposals and this mass public investment depend on expansion of mining. And I, I want to just put this into the discussion that really what we're not talking about, what we're now talking about, is that there's no green capitalism. Of course, there can be growth in certain areas, low impact areas, you know, there can be more music, there can be better health care, there can be a variety of things where there's growth. But what is the aggregate impact, in particular, in high material using areas that require more mining? Or at the other end, uh, you know, issues of the sinks of nature. So one of the issues that I would like to raise with you is, don't you think even in the no growth or the degrowth literature, there needs to be a distinction between a capitalist economy overall and growth, because I mean, capitalism as a system is inherently directed towards a competitive model of growth. I can certainly see some form of socialism with some form of strategic planning in which markets operate. And there's a degree of private ownership and, and uh, you know, loose planning, okay? But you'll never get rid of the distributional issues under a class-divided capitalism. 
uh, I deal with mining towns and they're perfect examples of no growth. The populations are declining and what you see in a no growth capitalism is more poverty. Major adjustment costs, unmet environmental and health needs. We know what happens under capitalism when, when there's no growth. And that's why, for example, I think the, the labor movement is not big on degrowth because they see right now that if it's implemented, it'll be people at the bottom who are suffering most from, from a lack of growth. So I just want to ask all of you, don't you think that the issue of growth needs to be separated from the structures of capitalism and that the issue of the environment needs to be addressed with a full, honest, open discussion about the nature of capitalism? Thank you, David, for your, your question. We will start with Luison and then we, we pass over to, to the others. Uh, thanks very much, and David. For, uh, it for seems sorry. that my connection is, is getting lost. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so it's fine. So let's start with Luison answer. And this, is, this will be the, the, the last question. So this is the, 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 the finishing question. So Luison, please. Yeah, thank you very much, David, for your, for your question. And it's, actually, it's a, it's a very good question. And uh, I, I could see uh, uh, Romain smiling a bit uh, while you were asking your question, because it's something we've been discussing, uh, Romain and I, recently. And we have been boiling to write something uh, about this soon because uh, this is a huge criticism that uh, we have against ecological economics, for instance, which has developed a very uh, deep and uh, relevant and interesting teaching of growth, but which has essentially never uh, questioned the underlying society in which growth emerged. And it goes beyond that. If you talk to uh, people like Tim Jackson or Peter Victor, for instance, uh, or uh, Sigrid Stagger here in Austria, for instance, there are uh, great people doing super interesting things, but they will tell you explicitly they are not interested in the question of capital. So there is a, there, there is a huge theoretical blind spot in ecological economics that needs to be, uh, that needs to be uh, unveiled to some extent. And I think this is where um, the integration of ecological economics with other approach like post-Keynesian economics, economics or regulation theory who uh, approach that knows what capitalism is and who, which has a lot of, the, of, of things to say about capitalism would be very, very fruitful. Uh, so that being said, yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree with you. And this is where I think we, there is a whole uh, conceptual uh, discussion to have as well on what we mean by uh, degrowth, who, that also echoes uh, what um, Louis Philippe and Yanis were saying before. And it's clear, I agree with you, and it's also a point we make uh, in our paper of 2016 with, uh, with Marc Lavoie, that crisis capitalism, uh, no growth capitalism can exist. Huh? We had it with the secular stagnation, but it's crisis capitalism. And it's not going to fulfill uh, the social needs, the social basic needs. So if we want to get rid of growth, uh, we need to reorganize society in another way. And in particular, we need to decommodify society. Uh, and decommodifica decommodification, and I will stop by this, a decommodification in the sense of, uh, for instance, uh, your style being on their stand, which, uh, which relate to the ability of, of people to satisfy their social basic needs independently of their ability to take part in the labor market, that is independently to, of their ability to, uh, to earn a wage. And I think there is a way to do it. Uh, it's to, uh, to develop the notion of um, universal basic income, but not in money, in kind. That is, uh, you essentially extend social security to uh, beyond health or beyond retirement, but also to sectors such as housing, such as education, such as energy, transportation, and even food. There is a recent proposal in France by some um, agricultural organization to have a social security for food, for instance. So uh, that way you decommodify life uh, and uh, you, you can reorganize society uh, around a, a distribution mechanism that do not rely on the ability of people to take part in the, in, in the market. And uh, I think the good news here is that we already see some form of it uh, at the local scale sometimes, or we also know it in our societies with social security for health, for instance. So we already know how to do it, essentially. Uh, so it's, it's not, I think it's uh, the horizon of, possi of, uh, of possibilities actually uh, perhaps closer than what we might think at the uh, first sight. Thank you, Luison. Yanis? 
Okay, great. I think uh, this is a very interesting discussion. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, first, regarding the point about whether it is too late. I mean, I totally agree with you, Louis Philippe. Uh, we have to consider both things that need to be done in terms of climate mitigation, I mean, in terms of reducing carbon emissions. But at the same time, we know that climate change is with us. It's going to be much more severe in the next one or two decades. And I think there are various issues related with climate adaptation. And I would like to raise the, the, the point that uh, we need to think a lot about the climate injustice related to with uh, the way that climate change is going to affect the global south much more compared to the global north. And in that sense, we need to, uh, to have a new way of thinking about the, the way that these countries are going to address what they're going to see with climate change. Uh, because most of the emissions have been created by the global north, but actually most of the effects will be seen in these countries. And this is why it is important to, to talk about climate injustice. And this is why it's important to to think carefully about uh, the way that these countries uh, uh, can uh, have access to finance, can actually have the independency to create their own policies to address these problems. Uh, so in that sense, climate adaptation is, a, is, is a, for me another, uh, to use uh, uh, Roman's expression, another big elephant in the room because we have to address it. Uh, we, because we know that we are not going to avoid two degrees, so uh, we need to have a serious discussion about that. Uh, very quickly uh, on uh, uh, what Roman said before about growth and uh, the need to uh, to reconsider the system overall. I, I, I very much agree with that perspective. I'm just trying to, to talk uh, a bit about the way that this can be done in practice. And let me say first that for me, when I'm talking about green investment, I think that especially for the private sector, it's not that we are going to see a growth, that we need to see a growth in overall investment, because in most cases, we are talking about the replacement of dirty investment with green investment. Uh, so when I'm talking about the growth of investment, I primarily refer to public investment, because in a sense, we, we need some public investment that has to do uh, with uh, the way that electricity is, uh, uh, is uh, transmitted, with the way that we build a public transportation. And I expect that we, we, are, we have to see some increase there. But at the same time, we know that there will be rebound effects for carbon emissions. Because uh, these, uh, these, these types of policies are going to lead to higher production. And at least in the first years, we have to rely on, uh, on uh, carbon intensive uh, productions in order to do that. And it's also important to take into account that there are negative effects on the use of materials. There are negative effects probably on biodiversity. When we build uh, solar panels, we might rely on uh, people who are exploited in the global south. So all these are, are very uh, important uh, issues that we have to think carefully about. So in that sense, I very much agree with this broader perspective that we have to, to reconsider the whole system overall and try to, to, to be more uh, radical. Uh, and I, I, I just think that uh, it's very important uh, to, to, to make it clear to everyone who is part of the system that we have to reconsider the way that we decide about all these issues. And this is why I talked before about the need to, to look at the, the whole system. Now, how exactly we are going to, to, to have it, the transition to a very different society and what is the best strategy to do that? I, I think this might, there might be a big debate about this uh, because someone could talk about a very big radical change uh, which can be driven by the climate catastrophe. Uh, one could argue that it is necessary to do this a bit more gradually and try to, to call into question uh, various institutions in the current system. I mean, this is a very, a very, a very big discussion. Uh, my view is that we need to have to see radical changes. So I overall agree with that. But I don't think it's, it's so straightforward. And we have to think about a lot of different uh, aspects. And just a quick comment on the universal basic uh, income. 
I mean, I think what uh, Louison mentioned is uh, the idea of universal basic services. And, and I, I very much agree with this distinction between social transfers in kind and social transfers in caste. And to be honest, if we look at the social protection systems in, in the past, in, in, in some uh, countries like uh, Sweden or Finland, uh, you can see that this idea that the, the public sector provides universal services to, to people was always very strong. And I think that when we have these discussions about uh, universal basic, uh, in, uh, the idea of the universal basic income, the, I, the idea of a jobs guarantee, I think it makes sense to, to see what has happened in the past because I think some of the social protection systems in the past have been quite successful and we can learn from, from, from that. Uh, anyway, I'll stop here. Uh, so I very much agree with the, the, the whole uh, idea that we need to, to see radical changes uh, and hopefully we will manage to do that uh, quickly. Thank you, Yanis. Romain? Yeah, so it's, um, I'll try to be very brief and I don't really know where, where to start, but um, I would say that, um, I mean, it started with um, David's question and I really agree that the, the way we're approaching the question so far, I was thinking while uh, Luis, Luison and Yanis were speaking, I think that what I see usually when it comes to this big question, you're like, oh, should we think beyond growth, basically? And we have like three uh, kind of like approaches so far, and I find them, the three of them quite unsatisfactory. There's the, the approach that, uh, that Louison mentioned where, you know, like you, it's like, no, it's all good. Look, I mean, some ecological economists work on that. You have like a capitalist economy uh, with degrowth and everything's fine, you know, like, and I, I mean, I really don't believe that that's the case. And then you have like some sort of like, you know, like, uh, a priori anti-capitalist perspectives, but that's, you know, like becomes difficult to, to relate to, you know, like what, what do we do? Where do we go from here? A little bit what Yanis was uh, referring to, you know, like what's the next step? I mean, what, what's the point of, uh, and then you have also like the third approach, which is, um, oh, we've been using the wrong indica indicators. So we need to use other indicators, which, you know, like it's fine. We, we, we could have other indicators, but still, if the GDP is growing, what does that mean in terms of, uh, of inequalities, of, you know, like ability to regulate capitalism? And then if you want, and, and that's where perhaps I have, a, 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 I mean, we, we, I, I agree with Lison, we need, you know, like to merge all these disciplines, first and central regulationist. But if we think about, you know, like what, what monetary system for that? Um, I mean, what I would argue, what I understand from you know, like historical studies that the, the, the monetary system we live in is somehow it's more like a, a public-private partnership to some extent, you know, like it's indigenous money created by banks developed to the, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and then you have the, the creation of central banks as some sort of like organizer of the, 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 the payment systems. And, 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 you know, like, for instance, Jérôme Blanc in Lyon talks about, you know, like this kind of monetary system as the he calls it, I think, the, the industrial monetary system. So all the alternative we've been discussing correspond to the industrial monetary system. Is it the one we should be thinking about for a post-growth society? And that, that brings like huge questions, but I agree with uh, David's point, like we should be addressing this question like without, you know, like uh, we shouldn't be dodging that. Um, but once we do so, it brings us very far, very rapidly. And I mean, personally, I'm, I find it fascinating, but I really, you know, like it goes way beyond my ability to think about what can be done. So, so in the in the next step, I agree more with uh, with uh, Yanis Wilson's perspective about you know like where investments are needed. Uh, we need a lot of adaptation. We need to focus on developing and low income countries, and this is what we should be thinking about in any case, whatever we we think about you know like what could happen in, in 10, 50 years. So, it's an unsatisfactory response, but uh, but but it's. Uh, but I think the question is, is very interesting and very important. Thank but you all for... At, at the end of the 10 book series, we will have all the answers, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> Maybe not. So, Louis Philippe, do you want to say something to close? I just want to thank everybody. Um, uh, it's been a very, very interesting discussion. And it's probably the discussion in this book or, you know, there is a book uh, on the topic itself, but it is the topic on which I am the most, I don't want to say uncomfortable, uh, maybe less knowledgeable for sure, 
Um, and so for me, it makes it more interesting. And I know I've got to, to learn more about this, uh, but I did find it, uh, the discussion today, uh, uh, very, very interesting. So thank you all three for agreeing to participate today and for agreeing to participate in the book. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. Thanks. I hope to see you next Monday. It will be our last, our last webinar series on this book. It will be 11 a.m. on New York Times. So if you can attend, please, you are welcome. And well, I think that's all. We can we can close now. So nice to see you all. Thank you once uh, again for your presentation. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.